Welcome to the Expert PK and Newbie Podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Expert PK and Newbie Podcast, the podcast where each week we take a passage of the Bible, we read it together and we get the different perspectives from three different people. As always, I have with me Lachlan Miller, our expert. Hello. Morgan Carter, our newbie. Hi. And I'm Josh, Joshua Lee, our PK. How are we going, guys? I'm doing well. Um, I've just had an excellent weekend celebrating my one-year anniversary, wedding yeah. anniversary with my wife. Oh, congratulations. Um, and I have no idea how a year a year has passed. Like, mm. just, it doesn't make sense to me how a whole year has passed, but it's been a really excellent year. So that's been my week slash weekend. So yeah. I've come into this episode in very high spirits. Mm, that's a very nice week to have. Yeah, absolutely. How are you, Morgan? I'm good. I finished up my job after three years of working in a COVID position, which was so hard. So feeling very free and light. Mm. Yeah. Looking forward to some time off and yeah, just yeah. excited for a break. Absolutely. Yeah. Nice. Oh, good. And Josh? Good. Doing well. Came back from a trip away to Canberra, a work trip mm-hmm. out to Canberra. And even though, you know, like I said last week, it's you're working, but it's still nice to get out of Sydney and, and sort of experience something new. It was nice. It was colder down mm-hmm. there, not getting to escape the Sydney heap. So it was just a nice, nice time to just, I don't know. Do something, do something a bit different, which was nice. But yeah, no, doing, doing, doing well. Excellent to hear. So we should plug it because we have a Patreon. Mm. Um, if you want to support the podcast in a financial sense, uh, then head over to our Patreon. We have a couple of tiers that can offer a different. Um, sort of benefits, or if you just want to sort of support us uh, however you would like, you can also do one-off sort of donations, if, mm. if you will. But head over to Patreon uh, if you want to sort of get more information about that. We'd love uh, to get your support there. So, Lockie, what uh, chapters are we doing today? We're going to read chapters 10 and 11 of Genesis. Today's passage comes from the book of Genesis, chapters 10 and 11. These chapters show how the human population recovered after the flood, before being spread all over the planet after God's judgment upon those who were building the Tower of Babel. So just before we actually get into chapter 10, last week we ran out of time um, because we have day jobs and so uh, Patreon could be a way to help us have more time. Um, (laughs) But otherwise, uh, we ran out of time to finish the story of Noah. And so before we dive into chapter 10, I figured we should go back to chapter 9, starting from verse 18, because we never discussed the ending of the story of Noah. Uh, But just before that, could someone give us, give our listeners, especially a summary of what we talked about last episode? Yeah. So last episode, we talked about um, the story of Noah's Ark and the big flood. We (laughs) talked about who was on the boat, what they went through, kind of a bit of a timeline. And then we ended the last episode on, they were just landing back on dry land. Yeah. Mm. And we saw God's covenant. Mm. God's agreement, mm. God's promise to to Noah and also the uh, people, you know, coming after after Noah and um, sort of vowing never to do something as destructive like this ever, ever again. Mm. We ended on a really positive note for Noah, this blameless, yes. upright man. Um, if we had just ended the story there, we would think that he is kind of the model disciple. Mm. However, there is one final chapter of his story, which I think shows that humanity has not been purged of evil. So while God did away with all the evilness in the flood, it still exists. And it's such a left out of left field sort of story of getting getting up to getting up to the end here just before before 10 because like what you said we always think of Noah as the upstanding upstanding mm. citizen that just throughout his journey is you know so devoted to God and is so quote unquote like good if mm. if, if you want to put it, put it that way just always forget about this this next bit because it's a bit icky it's a bit weird it is a bit weird now there's the chance our listeners haven't read chapter 9 recently because we didn't tell them to. Could someone give us a quick summary of what happens at the very end here of chapter nine? Noah gets drunk. <laughs> yeah, Noah gets drunk. He's sort of, <laughs> if you want to boil down the story to a, the simplest <laughs> element. This is actually the first appearance of alcohol in the Bible. I mean, we're, we're in chapter nine of the whole Bible, so that probably isn't that surprising. But the first appearance of alcohol we see is quite a negative appearance of alcohol. Mm. Noah's sons come and find Noah naked. Inside of his tent, on the ground, I'm imagining, drunk out of his mind. Yes, or absolutely wasted. Absolutely wasted, naked, on the ground, like 
you know, for your sons to discover that, like, you know, I can't imagine just finding your own father and like, oh boy, what's happened? Mm. And some <laughs> have argued that because Noah was meant to be this righteous, blameless figure, that it was out of naivety that he got drunk. Like, this mm. is the first appearance of alcohol. Maybe he didn't realise that. However, I think we're meant to view this story as a really negative moment in the life of Noah rather than as a whoops accident. Yes, I don't think it's... It'd be weird if it wasn't accident. It seems very out of character. Well, thinking about the story, it seems out of very character to be to be an ac- accident. I, I see it as this sort of almost like this PTSD moment. Like you've been a year, <laughs> yep. like a year on a boat. Mm-hmm. That's got to mess you up somehow. Like, you know, no matter like how sort of righteous you might be, you're going to have some demons that you sort of take with you of like the animals that you've had to spend time with you know just the endless ocean um thinking thinking about it that way like you know i couldn't i couldn't imagine sort of then having to go back to norm, normal life after that and sort of the re readjusting and i almost don't blame him for going on the drink <laughs> i don't like you know i don't condone it like 100 percent. i don't think that's uh, that that's the way but you can understand if that was the action being taken he's unfortunately found solace in the drink Mm. And, like, the first two times alcohol is mentioned in the Bible is here and then in the story of Lot and his daughters, which we'll get to in a few weeks. It is an exceptionally negative story. But I think what we're we're meant to have a bigger worldview than just this one negative story about alcohol because I think as we consider the rest of the Bible, we're meant to see alcohol as a blessing from God for us to enjoy. Mm. And so what Noah does here by planting a vineyard is not a bad thing. The Bible always talks about drunkenness as a bad thing, but alcohol itself is not viewed negatively as a whole in the Bible. But in its first mention, we see that it's a very, very risky thing. Like there's a great risk to alcohol Mm. because it's put Noah in this very compromised position. Mm. It's a gift, but too much of of it is going to lead you down a negative path. Yeah, I'll give a resource if someone wants to dive into the idea of alcohol in the Bible better. Go watch Mike Winger's video on what does the Bible really say about alcohol. It's really helpful. You need a few hours to listen to it, but if you listen to our podcast, then you clearly are happy to listen to things that go for a few hours. So go check out that resource to think about alcohol in the Bible. But for now, Josh, you said that Noah's sons discovered him. Yes. But the text actually just says that Ham, one of his sons, discovered him and looked upon him naked. Mm. And to the ancients, like to ancient people, seeing one's father naked was like a breach of the family ethic. Like it was Mm. a morally dangerous and rude and devastating thing for a family unit, for one of the, any of the children to see their father naked. Mm. Because in their mind, that started to undo the power and authority that that father was therefore meant to have in that family. And so it's not that Ham necessarily did anything more than just unrepentantly look upon his father naked And then go to his brothers to laugh about it and was like, guys, go see what dad did. So Ham did something quite negative in their culture. Yeah. And so I guess that's why Noah then curses Ham. Yeah, but he doesn't necessarily curse Ham. He curses Ham's son. Yeah. Which is a bit more brutal, if I do say so myself. And and sort of taking a step back before we get to get to that, it's like even even still the the two other brothers go to robe. Noah hmm. and Noah's like, nah, I don't. What are you doing? Like, you know, it's the it's the complete opposite. You would think, you know, they're doing some sort of like service, but I guess like what you're saying, well, maybe that's even more demeaning that the sons are robing Noah. No, I, don't, I think we're meant to view the other two sons in a very positive light because the text twice says that they walk in backwards. Like, it doesn't okay. just say it once; it literally twice says they walked in backwards with a robe between them to place over their father. Mm. so that they did not see him naked. They were doing the best they could to not break this ancient family ethic. And so they're actually seen really positively because after Canaan gets cursed, Noah then specifically praises and blesses his other two sons. Uh, yep. Yeah, I read it as Canaan kind of embarrassed him. Like he didn't need to tell the other two he could have just covered him up. That's how I read it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I think it's because Ham, so Noah's son Ham, has broken his father's trust and therefore Noah curses Ham's son, Canaan. Like there's, it's just, it's a little confusing about why Canaan is the focus here. Some think that because Canaan was also involved, as in 
he, along with his father, Ham, witnessed this. Mm. Others think it's just meant to be looking forward into the biblical story and go, rather than necessarily being a curse of Canaan, it's a recognition that Canaan's descendants, who would be the Canaanites, were people who were well known to be morally dubious people. Mm. And so Mm. it's almost more of a prophecy than a curse in a sense of uh, Ham did this awful thing and from his family line through Canaan are going to be people who will continue to do horrible things so much so that God eventually is going to judge them by getting Israel to invade their lands. Mm. In a way, like, you know, that the, the punishment is even more, has even more weight to it if someone else is punished instead of you because you then have to bear that moral weight of like my actions actually affected other other people mm. you know it'd be one it would be one thing for him just to ride the curse himself and then you know no one else no one else is effective but it's almost like that twofold of like well canaan is is cursed and in and technically ham wasn't like quote unquote cursed because like directly but in a way kind of was because then he now has to like bear that sort of sin almost of the effects that it had it it has now on on Canaan if that makes sense like what we see before when we see the um genealogies and the descendants it also is phrased the same of how long Noah lived for like another mm. uh 350 years and then giving how long he lived but this time it says and he died yep and and we at the start of Noah's story we got he walked righteously with God. And we have saw uh, one of um, Adam and Eve's descendants being taken away with God and everyone else dying. Yep, Enoch. Enoch. And now, even though at the start of the story, Noah was walking with God, he just now just dies. Hmm. I don't know if we're meant to read the story of Enoch as the expectation of faithful living with Yahweh, because we're about to dive into the story of Abraham in a few weeks' time. And his story is ends with death, and yet we get very detailed account of his life, and he is a faithful man, ultimately, right up until the end. And Mm. so I think we're meant to see Enoch as the exception and not see everyone else's death as like a, oh, they didn't quite live up to the standard. Mm. I guess for me, it gives that more, this is the fall of Noah, Mm. that even even the righteous will fall. And he was still, you know, still a faithful servant, still did everything, you know, (laughs) according to this story, without Noah, none of us would have existed, like none of us exist um, from it because we were all descendants from Noah. Maybe. Depends what view you finally landed on, Josh. (laughs) Have you done some more research? Search since last episode? No. <laughs> still still wrapping my head around it before we, we you know, confuse myself even more by more research. Uh, <laughs> but I guess, like, you know, potentially we could take away that, like, everyone is susceptible to, um, like, the fall of grace hmm. sort, sort of thing. Uh, no one is uh, immune immune to that. Hmm. And even Noah can be like that. So, yeah. Whether, you know, whether it's digging too deep into it or it, we should just take it as, and he just died. Not sure. Yeah. The only other thing I want to bring up for the end of chapter nine is in the oracle about Shem, it's the only oracle that includes the name Yahweh. So praise be to Yahweh, the God of Shem. And so out of all three sons of Noah that are talked about at the end of this chapter, It's only Shem that seems to have a personal relationship with Yahweh, Mm. which is a potential way to read that, is he is the one son where it is clearly said that he is in relationship with Yahweh. And it's also from Shem that we're eventually going to get Abraham and then Israel. Mm. And then I guess Jesus, if you just keep going all the way. So Shem is who is, and the descendants of Shem is who we follow in the Old Testament. Yes, that will be the line that we will follow from now on, which is probably a good way to then jump to chapter 10 as we read about all the descendants of the three sons of Noah. And we will explicitly see that it is from Shem that we get the rest of the biblical story. Mm. So let's jump to chapter 10. 10. Any opening comments about chapter 10? You had a question last time, Morgan, which was how can this all happen? I think her question, because I just listened to our <laughs> previous episode, was how did they repopulate the world after the flood? Yeah, just how slowly it would have taken to get, because it said be fruitful and fill the land or something along those lines. Mm. Like it would have taken a long time. Yeah, definitely. Mm. Like nine months pregnancies and then waiting for them to be old enough to reproduce. Like it would just take a long time. 
Yeah, absolutely. But what we see from chapter 10 is here are 70 nations that descend from the three sons of Noah. And so if you if you look through all the people listed here, we literally get 70 different people groups that come out of these three sons of Noah. And so we're meant to read this as the repopulization. Is that a word? The repopulation of yeah. the earth as uh, all of the three sons of Noah have kids who have kids who have kids. Mm. Would the women have been related to their partners? <laughs> Again, this will depend on where you eventually landed with the flood story from last episode, but theoretically, yes. So the children could be inbred. Again, theoretically, yes. <laughs> if it was a worldwide flood where literally only those eight people survived, you have the three sons of Noah and then three their three wives. So everyone is related to those six people somehow. Um, is if you take the world wide view of the flood, mm. I argued for a localized flood that the scripture is portraying as a worldwide flood for theological reasons. That's what I argued for last episode, in which case I don't even need to consider inbreeding as part of my worldview. <laughs> no, 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 no incest to be seen. Just on the topic of the fact that we see 70 different people in this list, there's two other times in the Bible I could think of that use the number 70. Uh, the first is uh, the 70 descendants of Jacob who go down to Egypt in Genesis 46, and then also the 70 disciples of Jesus who are sent out in Luke 10 to spread the gospel. I don't know if... That is really a callback at all to these 70 nations, but mm. just thought it was worth bringing up when you see a number repeated in scripture. Mm. I just got really lost when reading 10. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So lost. <laughs> that is fair. Mm. And it's it's easy, like all genealogies, it's easy just to sort of want to skip this mm. section because it's, you know, this, it's not like a meaty story, you know, where's the sort of, where's the life lesson out of just knowing the dis, the descendants and just having a whole bunch of names thrown at us, especially it's like, well, I'm going to just get to the bit of the salvation part. Uh, <laughs> Can I suggest what this chapter is trying to show, as well as showing the repopulation of the earth post-flood, it's also showing the political, geographical and ethnic affiliations between different tribes. Mm. And so, for instance, if you look at everyone who's descended from Ham, who is the one who sins greatly against his father Noah, almost every nation listed there is an enemy of Israel at some point. Mm. It's almost like this is a list of the people that we don't get along with. Alternatively, if we look at like the descendants of Shem, everyone listed there at some point has some type of familiar or good relationship with Israel because that is Israel's kin. Like all of Israel comes from Shem. And mm. so therefore this is actually seen as really positive people in this list. And then you have the third son of Noah, who's just sort of like, ah, those other remote people. Like <laughs> everyone listed in that genealogy is like remote Northern tribes you kind of get the Greeks from there. You get the Scythian hordes from there, like a whole bunch of people. The seafarers, so those mm. who spread out much further afield. So it's almost like all the neutral people compared to Israel. Mm. And so I think we are meant to read this as like neutral, negative, positive yep. in terms of Israel's view about the different tribes that surround them as a nation. Mm. Why do they only focus on the sons of these people? Like, where are the women? Israel is an inherently patriarchal culture, would just be my standard response to that, is there's obviously women involved because there's children being produced here, mm. but is the father's line, the father's name that is significant to the people of Israel. It's also probably the men who had a greater impact politically, militarily, purely because of the differences between men and women, especially in an ancient culture when men hold all the power, make the decisions, mm. are the most involved. Like they just have that inherent strength over their female counterparts. And so there, there is no equality in the ancient Near East. And so it's the men yeah. that matter in this particular moment. Interesting. Product of its time. <laughs> Definitely. It's interesting that at the end of each descendant, it, it, it states that, you know, each of these clans can be identified by its own language, its own clan, its own national identity, mm. sort of affirming that these are, like, these are slash will be, like, proper set up like civilizations mm. that will will pop up it's not like oh these people went off and did that and we don't know what's going to happen to them or just sort of fleeting away it's like no no these like you like you said it's the repopulation of the earth and for especially for us getting being able to get a, like a full sort of view of history in itself this is sort of affirming where all these different nations have, mm. have sort of come from and you know where where they spread spread across across the earth yeah and it's affirming it by like you 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 will know them by these identifica identifications. Mm. 
I'd like to know a little bit about Nimrod because it's a bit of a strange name. They're all strange, but Nimrod just stands out. <laughs> yeah, fair. The name Nimrod seems to come from the word to rebel. So he's meant to be seen as a negative character, especially since he comes from the line of Ham. Again, the line of Ham is all of the negative nations around Israel. Like you see Egypt in there, you see the Canaanites in there, and you see Nimrod, who was the person who founded Babylon. Like, this is one of the biggest bads when it comes to Israelite history is Babylon. And we see its founder is a son of Ham and a mighty hunter. Yeah, he creates those um, cities that start to become very familiar with us. Mm. Um, that was, you know, that was definitely the thing that stood out for me. Is like, oh, you know, he's a, he's, a, he's, a great hunt, he's a great hunter. And then you're like, oh, he created those cities. Oh, like, you know. Yeah. Like, it starts to put that context in, in in it for us. And especially it sort of hits home more now when it's like, oh, he's a descendant from Ham. Mm. Mm. Like, oh, okay. And those puzzle pieces starting to sort of put together. Like, oh, okay. So this is the, this is the cursed <laughs> descendant. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's almost like the negative line. And mm. we're meant to see that over and over is the descendants of Ham are the negative people. So in reading the three groups, the Japheth, the Ham and the Shem, why is the Japheth so like short? And then at the end of the other ones, they end with saying these are the sons of who it was, but he's just is like cut off. Like it's so short and small. Yeah, I think it's like I was saying before, that group of people are sort of like the neutral far-flung nations. And so in the worldview of an ancient Israelite, it's uh, all the descendants of Shem are the people groups around us that we have positive interactions with. All the descendants of Ham are the people groups around us that we are often at war with. And those final group are those who are far afield. We don't really know who they are. They're the ones who spread across the rest of the globe. Okay. Because, yeah, it's the only one where it doesn't mention, like, these are the son of by their clans and languages in their territories and nations. Mm. doesn't say it like the other two. Yeah. And, again, I think it's because these are the people that they don't have many interactions with. Mm. Mm. Sort of like, quote, unquote, less important in the context of the story. Yes. Still important in terms of the population of the earth, but to, in terms of the interaction, like you said, between the descendants of Ham and Shem combating each other. Yes. And now I guess coming to the Shem line, there's a few, I think, quite notable things in this. Firstly, this Shem line is where we get the word Semitic from. Mm. Um, so if you hear about Semitic people groups or the context, you probably hear it more is uh, anti-Semitic crime. But th these are the people groups that come from that word. Um, some notable people within this list are Eber, which is where we get the word Hebrew from. Oh. So it's like all the descendants of Eber or Eber are the Hebrew people groups. And that's the first use of the word Hebrew in scripture. The other notable descendant in Shem's line is Peleg. And that's because in his time, the earth was divided. So in other words, I think Peleg was alive during the Tower of Babel story that we're about to read. Mm. And so it's specifically pointing out that that is where in this timeline the Tower of Babel sits, is during the lifetime of Peleg. So before we get to talking about the Tower of Babel, I just want to ask in the start of 11, where it says the whole world had one language, mm -hmm. what language was that? No idea. <laughs> I was hoping you'd know. <laughs> I'm sorry. We're meant to read chapter 11 as the biblical explanation about why humanity is so divided, even down to the very language we speak. Like, this mm. is the explanation of why, but as for what language that is, <laughs> no idea. So, on the topic of language, it says that each clan territory can be identified by its own language, mm. but then we go on to the like, Tower of Babel and it says, oh, everyone had their was speaking the one language but that's more so that can get a little confusing it's like hang on but weren't there multiple languages but now there's now there's one languages however it's this is giving back in chapter 10 seeing all the descendants that's giving you the broad overview of every of everything and the languages that came after the tower after of babel the, event yeah yep. and it's just the order of it is just it's this is just how it's been ordered it doesn't it's not to say that it's like contradicting one another. No. It's just saying that after the Tower of Babel, then all the clans had their own their own languages. Mm. Yeah, because as we just said, the Tower of Babel event fits in with the time of Peleg, mm. which is what, the fifth generation of the Shemites? Which means like the, the genealogy goes on after Peleg for several more. And so we're not meant to get to the end of that genealogy and go, now comes the Tower of Babel. Mm. We're meant to realise that this story we're about to read slots back in much earlier in chapter 10. And I think that's the, like one of the confusing parts 
especially in Genesis. Because as we saw in early, earlier bits of Genesis and the, the, confu- the confusion there, because we could read, like, we naturally are going to read a story from start to finish and think mm. it's in a linear order where this is, yes, it's linear in a sense, but there are bits where it sort of jumps around and gives you sort of maybe a bit of greater context and we sort of just have to, like, know and understand that it's not always linear like that. Mm. Does um, Babel in this have anything to do with Babylon or no? No, yeah, it, it absolutely does. And so it says specifically that all the people came to the plain of Shinar, which is actually the area of Babylon. It then says mm-hmm. they built a tower right, and the first kind of ziggurat we know about in history mm, was constructed in Babylon, like it was the Babylonian ziggurat. Mm. And so, yes, everything about this story is meant to think, oh, we're talking about Babylon. What a strong word, ziggurat. Oh, it's a great word, hey. Mm. <laughs> and, and and we think of this as like... Like it's a straight up like tower, like a like a medieval like like quote unquote like a medieval like style tower where a ziggurat is not no that no a ziggurat kind of think think a pyramid mm. but instead of being hollow or well designed inside it's like a pile of rubble that you then build the pyramid around mm. sort of in like one layer and keep going up 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 until you sort of have like the the point yeah but not like a Egyptian pyramid, which is just, which we we think is sort of very like smooth Mm. triangles on, you know, each face on each side. And pyramids also have internal spaces where again, a ziggurat is you make a giant pile of rubble Mm. and then you build up around that. Um, And a ziggurat in the ancient world was often seen as a, a place for the gods to come to. You could almost view it as uh, an elevator of a ziggurat made it easier for a god who lived up in heaven or some other space Mm. to come down to earth because it was less of a journey for them. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Less distance for them to come come down. I mean, that's why mountaintops are often the source of spiritual experiences Mm. because of that same worldview is... uh, It's closer to the gods in heaven. Yeah. So I always thought it was like, like it is like, you know, that whole idea of closer to the gods, but I always thought, thought it was like the opposite. Oh, I typically think it's the opposite of like, we can get higher mm. to the quote unquote gods um, because of that short distance rather than them coming down to us. Well, that's how in the Tower of Babel it starts, right? Mm. Is they want to reach up until heaven with their tower mm. so that they may make a name for themselves, which I think begins to hint at what some of the sins of the people building this tower are. And so I think the first is immense pride. Like this was a rebellion against God. Like they, they wanted to be seen great and have their own name put out there. The other sin that I think these people are committing is the reason they want to build this tower is so that they are not scattered across the face of the whole earth. And yet God's instruction to Noah's descendants after they get off the ark is be fruitful and multiply across the face of the earth. God is keen to have humanity spread out and take possession of the earth as a whole. And yet the people are staying together and pridefully wanting to make a name for themselves. And I think those are the two biggest sins that are being committed here that then causes God to intervene. Mm. And it, on first glance, it doesn't really read as if they're kind of like sinning. Like if you were to just sort of read this quickly and forget all the other, like, you know, what God, God's commands to do, you're like, Oh, they're being united and and coming to and coming together. Like you know, isn't that a positive? Isn't thing? that a great thing? Yeah, like, isn't that a positive thing? And especially when when it says that, but the Lord came down to look at the city and the tower that they built and said, "Look, the people are united and they all speak the same language." You're like, but isn't this a like a like, like isn't this a po- like a like a positive positive thing here? Why you know why why would God scatter scatter them? But like you said, it's going against the command. Mm. Yeah, there's there's breaking of the command to take possession of the earth is also the pride Mm. we see in james 5 that god is someone who always puts down the prideful and raises up the humble like that is part of what god does Mm. and we see here immense pride Um, i also think it's very very ironic that the lord had to come down to see this (laughs) tower like their whole purpose is we're going to build a tower that goes up into the heavens and yet god has to literally leave heaven come down to earth to look at this little tower that they're constructing. I think there's meant to be irony in that sentence. This <laughs> sassy god of, like, oh, I'm, I'm going to come down to you to see it. Like, yeah, yeah, I the... can't see it from <laughs> up where I am. Up here, well, tower, you say? Oh, I don't <laughs> see a tower. Oh, oh, that tower. Yes, no, now I see it, like, very demeaning. Like, Absolutely. In verse 6, 
you're saying like, you know, the, the people united and they all speak the same language. And then God continues to say, after this, nothing they set up will be impossible for them. Again, doesn't sound like a negative. Like nothing's going to be impossible for them, right? Mm. So it, it, it's adding to that, for me, at very least, that confusion of like, but they're united together. Nothing's going to be impossible. Isn't this, isn't this a good thing? Don't we want people to come together? I think we're meant to read this in the same way that we read God limiting the human lifespan. As, yes, humans together and living for a long time are capable of good things, but it is evil things that come about more often and more intensely. Mm. And so we're meant to read this as their unity and strength have the potential for great evil. Mm. And so God has this statement that they could do anything evil they set their minds to if they are this united. True. But we're not meant to read his comment as that of like a rival or someone who's like competing against them. We're meant to read it as a concerning father who goes, oh no, they have this potential and that's a bad thing and I care for them. So I don't want it to happen. Yeah. So he's not intimidated by it, but for their own good, he does want to do something to stop it. Yeah. And like, I'm naturally... Going to th- going to think. Oh, they're going to be positive about this. Yeah, I like your positive attitude. <laughs> no, 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 Josh. You know, it's <laughs> you know, it's good to good to think positively. But no, we forget that people you know need to give can also be negative, mm. and they can it can be a negative force that they they, they can do. Mm. No, never think of it that way. Yeah, yeah. So God's solution is to break the unification. Like verse seven is like, come, let's go down and confuse the people with like different languages. I, I like, I originally like read that and I was like, it's got a bit of a trickster, a bit of a joker here. <laughs> like I understand it now of like, you know, trying to prevent something that's, you know, like a catastrophe to happen and you know what, everything that happened prior to the flood, hmm. but without sort of like, you know, having that sort of context, you're like, come on guys. I would like, you know, I'm going to like it, like what, watch me as I like, you know, confuse them more and we'll, we'll watch and see how they, sort of go about their business now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what's interesting is in every judgment of God we've seen so far in Genesis, there is a hint of hope there somewhere. He gives Cain a mark. He saves Noah from the flood. But in this situation, there is no hope given. It's just left as humanity is now confused and separated and no longer unified. So I think what we're meant to do is after in this story, see that, oh, the ray of hope is God narrows in on one family to be his source of blessing. And then if we fast forward enough through the Bible to hit the New Testament, we then see Pentecost where Mm. Christians are given by the Holy Spirit the gift to speak other languages. Mm. And we're meant to see Pentecost as the great undoing of this judgment upon the Tower of Babel is in God's new kingdom, this is no longer an issue because people can be unified for a good goal. Mm. And so he gives them the ability to be unified and this curse, for lack of a better word, mm. is undone. No, definitely. And, you know, like, from from that, like, we can, like, in, in our days, we can speak multiple languages if we if we choose to. Um, we can we can learn uh, different, different languages and become um, bilingual and become unified like that. But, you know, yeah, naturally, we speak the one language that, that we know. Mm. I mean, the people of this time could also learn multiple languages, but there's something about the Holy Spirit that then removes that barrier mm. for the New Testament church, yeah. which is amazing. Verse 7, there's a plural on uh, let's. Yep, yep, yep. we so, talked about this a few times. Yep. So there's multiple... <laughs> Like, you know, is this a, and this is why, this is why, like, my thought process of, like, is God just playing a practical joke here? Because he's, like, you know, like, like, there's a group of people watching on, so, like, you know, but let's, so there were angels there or, or other beings? Again, there's uh, three options. One is, like, a heavenly council of angels that he's talking to and dictating this to. The second option is the royal we or the royal mm. us um, to display God's majesty and the third option is hints that there's more going on than just strict monotheism. Mm. A sort of the three options that are going on here. Yeah. Choose choose an option you like. <laughs> we yeah, we'll never know for sure. Absolutely. We could, we could pick it apart, but as as we always say with those like those details, it's not the point of the story. Mm. Where it says at the end of um, verse 4, otherwise we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth, and then in 9 it says from there the Lord scattered them, is that like showing that he will go through with his word? Mm. Mm. Like a bit of a warning like it's yeah, yeah. kind of confirming that? What's interesting about this story is that everything that mankind voices in the first half of this story as their concerns happens by the end of the story 
by God mm. making it happen. Mm. Like it's a very interesting structure. It's very interesting as you start to notice that is they're concerned about being scattered, so God scatters them. They want to make a name for themselves, so God humbles them. Like just everything they express, God undoes. Yeah, right. It's a bit of like a warning and then an action that follows through. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And they're like, they're, they're that concerned that they know that that might happen. So we're going to try and actively prevent it from happening. Yeah. And this event is the reason why this place is called Babel or Babylon. Mm. I'll explain that a bit more. So Babylon, the name means gate of the gods. Like the people of Babylon thought they were the closest place on earth to the heavenly realm. There's a word in Hebrew that is Belel, which means confused. And so what God is doing here is says these people claim that the name of their great city is Babel, which is close to God, but it's actually that they're just confused. Mm. It's anything further from being close to God. Yeah, yeah. It's a fun little play on words is they claim that they're close, but actually the true origin of their name is is the word Belel, which means they're confused. It's also worth pointing out that Babylon has a long presence in the Bible. And so here in Genesis 11, we see that it's a symbol of a godless society. Later on in Daniel, we see that Babylon is the the nation that persecutes those who are faithful to God. In Isaiah, we see that Babylon is kind of the center of sinful pleasure and sinful superstitions. And finally, in the book of Revelation, in chapter 17 and 18, we see the eventual doom and downfall of Babylon. And so this is the first appearance of them and they will continue to pop up throughout the rest of the biblical story from Mm. their first appearance as a unified humanity defying God to constantly defying God throughout the rest of the Bible. Mm. Is this story, the Tower of Babel, is... Do we have any sort of maybe knowledge or sort of thoughts on, like with Noah, Abraham, is this a literal, like, recounting of events? Is Mm. this more, as you put it, hyperbole, a bit more of, like, poetic style of writing um, or an actual tower that, you know, scattered everyone? Um, In terms of the, the city of Babylon itself, I think we are meant to read all of this as kind of really legit. And mm. so we know that their, their, their method, their style of making bricks was invented in that region at about 3000 BC. We have Babylonian accounts of the creation of their city, which again bases it in about 3000 BC. And they talk about how they inscribed every brick of the city of Babylon with the Babylonian god's name Marduk in every Mm. single brick. We also know that archaeologically ziggurats were first built in Babylon. It's kind of the first place we think we've ever seen them. And so all these other historical details start to line up to show that this seems to be a really legit story of a prideful group of people who gathered together. The only place that I would start to defer from this story would probably be the universal scope of it, Mm. which again is what I think the Noah story does, which is it takes one event and universalizes is it? Yeah. Because in 3000 BC, if that's the most logical time to base this, we already have groups of humans living in Australia and America and all over the world. Mm. And there's not enough time from this story for them to spread to those other locations. And so I think similar to the story of Noah, it universalizes a story that really did happen Mm. to convey a theological point. Yeah. Which I think is a lot of the story of Genesis Mm. is the theology is of prime importance in the first few chapters of Genesis and it wants it to convey a universal story because that theology is universal. Yeah. And yeah. then as we get a bit more grounded in terms of the story slows down dramatically when we hit Abraham, then I think Genesis as a whole starts focusing more on the events of Abraham and his life um, mm. and the theology is still there and important but no longer the, the central focus. Mm. That makes sense. Is it later on in the Bible where we have like the different like kings that are on these ziggurats and towers and things that sort of God sort of destroys. Is that? I have literally no idea what you're referring to. Is that like, what, <laughs> where have I seen that before? Like, I, I'm just trying to think of where I've seen that. Like, or someone's told the um, Tower of Babylon that way. I don't know. Somewhere I've seen where like the, um, unless it was to give more to context around ziggurats and saying like, you know, the, the like the rich or the kings would try and like as- ascend them and part of the like God's dismantling of, of them was to, so that like, well, it was to dis- also dismantle the, the false idols. I don't know. Hmm. To my knowledge, this is the only story in the Bible that references ziggurats. Mm. I think potentially what you're referring to is helpful background about what ziggurats mean and do and how they function in a society. Yeah. But I can't think of where in the Bible that might be referenced. Yeah. 
Maybe it's the Bible project that maybe we're so. Maybe but, uh, giving you some background. Yeah, they may have just done that to give background, but I don't know. I well, don't even know how we're going to talk about the next bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's just like the same thing, like just different numbers. <laughs> well, I mean, as you've just said, Morgan, it's hard to pull anything out of these next few verses in chapter 11 because it's a repeat of the end of chapter 10. Mm. But again, as I said, there's there's no hope in the story of the Tower of Babel. And yet I think the reader is meant to go, oh, this is where our hope is going to come from, is God is going to narrow down this line and focus on one particular individual. I like that they start to finally mention women, daughters. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah, and especially when we get to Abraham and Sarah, we'll we'll see more more figures pop up. Mm. Just girl's point of view, you know? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Yeah, fair. (laughs) You know, and, and... like, we're not there yet, but Sarah's story is, is you know, very much a unique story in her own right and a very important one in her own right as well. Mm. And the only other thing I'll point out about this little genealogy of from Shem to Abram is the ages get progressively shorter. Yeah. And so we have mm. God's big judgment before the flood that I'm going to limit their lifespan to 120 years. And what we see kind of by the end of this genealogy is that's basically been achieved, is it wasn't an immediate max cap of 120 years. It was a slow shortening. Mm. Yeah, because they're, they're now giving us, unlike at the end of chapter 10 where we're getting the descendants, now in Shem's descend, um, descendant line list of people, we're getting the numbers. Mm. Which if we got the numbers in chapter 10, that would have been a long chapter. (laughs) Yes. Um, What's also interesting about these ages is we've talked before about how you shouldn't take a biblical genealogy and therefore use that to perfectly predict the years or ages of things because biblical genealogies often skip generations. Um, And Mm. I just want to point out that even influential creationists like Whitcomb and Morris will say that, hey, if you look at the age of Peleg, who's the Tower of Babel, and then you look how many years it is to the time of Abraham, if you then look at the story of Abraham and how many different cultural groups he interacts with, there is not enough time in that short few hundred years in this genealogy for the huge nation sizes that Abraham encounters Mm. to have come about. And so even they will concede that it's probably been a few thousand years between the Tower of Babel and Abraham, even though the genealogy here seems short. And then we hit chapter 11, verse 27. This is the account of Terah's family line. Now, I said before that this this is basically a heading in the book of Genesis. Whenever you see the phrase, this is the account of dot, 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 this is a heading. And this is actually the sixth time we've seen this statement, which I think is interesting because it only appears 10 times. Mm. And so in the view of the book of Genesis, it's effectively saying, hey, you're in the second half of the book of Genesis now. Mm. Now, we still have most of Genesis to go, yeah. but this is a time most modern-day scholars will split Genesis from 1 to 11, mm-hmm. specifically this bit in 11, and then from 11 onwards. Because what we see is that it's not that the genre changes necessarily, but the story slows down. Like, we've been going across vast amount of years in the the far, far distant past, in this unknown past, this different world almost, And now the story is about to shift gear and slow down. And we're about to spend the rest of the book of Genesis on the story of basically three of the patriarchs, starting with Abraham. Mm. So just three people for the rest of the book of Genesis will be the main characters. Mm. And that's because here we sort of hit the halfway mark of Genesis, which again, feels crazy to say because we are at the end of chapter 11, but this is a different section we're about to begin in. Mm. And it's the section when Abram appears for the first time. Yes. And we should probably use the correct name yes. now because it will change later. But Abram, yes. Abram and how do, you pro- how do you pronounce Sarah's? Sarai. 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 Abram and Sarai. Yes, because until chapter 17, their names are Abram and Sarai. And it's a, and I think like we'll get to why that changes, but it's important. I think we should make the distinction early on. Yeah. Like, it would be very easy for us to be like Abraham and Sarah because that's what we know. Yes. That's who we, like the people that they become. And that's who they, yeah, turn into. Who, who turn into, you know, they, they that's and that's who, who we know. But for the context, for the importance of all of all of the story, we should make that distinction that they're not yet Abraham and Sarah. Now, I, whenever I think of Abram, I never think of him having siblings. 
then can I suggest you haven't read Genesis in a while because it's very no, significant. No, and then that's and that, but and I think that's like that's really great about going through it again because you see these like you you know these characters like for me growing like growing up with the faith you know you know the hallmark characters you know the typical ones that you go through with um, Sunday school and everything and you get to know but you forget the siblings the other aspects of of the story you just know all like you know like with Abraham and Sarah. You know Abraham and Sarah. You don't know know their names prior to that and their life prior to that. Yes, yeah, so f- like for like for me, it's 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 good like regrounding. Fair because Abraham's Abrams. Sorry, we're, we're going to get stuck with this for the we next are. few episodes. <laughs> Abrams' nephew Lot is a major character in the stories coming up. You only have a nephew if you have a, a brother or sister. Yes, and then he finds a a wife for his son Isaac from amongst his brother's family. And so again, oh. that's important. When Jacob flees from Esau way later in Genesis, mm. he goes to Nahor's family and lives there. Like we see Abraham's whole family mm. have a distinct impact. The other thing I'll point out is it's unlikely that Abram, he was the firstborn. He's probably put first in this genealogy because he's the most significant for our story. But when you do some of the maths, the maths doesn't work for Abraham to be only 75 when he departs for Canaan. Because based on Terah's age, his firstborn would have to be 135 years old at the time we're told Abraham departs to go to Canaan. And so just to point out, nothing else is just to say that Abraham was probably not the firstborn of Terah, but he is put first because he's the most important character. Mm, that makes sense. And then do we know anything else about Terah, Abraham's father? I don't, know. <laughs> Fair. Morgan? No. <laughs> the only other reference we have to Terah in the Bible comes from Joshua 24, where Joshua in a big sermon points out that Terah was a pagan, like he worshipped mm. other gods. And so that is meant to be significant when we are about to hit chapter 12 and the Lord calls to Abram, mm. is that this is not a man who was already raised to worship and believe in Yahweh. He was raised by a pagan. Mm. And so that is probably helpful background to even more appreciate the faith of Abram when he is called by Yahweh and actually acts on it. Definitely. I mean, that, that, that adds a whole different level of weight to it, hmm. which would then in turn probably mean that his siblings also were the same hmm. as well. Yeah. The name of Nahor's children, almost all of them are references to the moon god. Oh. And so you see that paganism is rife. And going on here, but Yahweh's going to step in mm. next time. <laughs> next time. Uh, next week. I think the only other prelude to next week that we should point out from the end of chapter 11 is that Sarai was childless. Mm. And that is a catastrophe for a woman in the ancient world. Like that, that is a very, very negative thing. The text wants us to see that and go, oh no, poor her, but also poor Abram for not having a family, which is of the utmost importance in this society. Mm. And you still see it in societies today as well from other other cultures. Not being able to either provide a family or have a family of your own can can very much be a contentious point mm. um, within many many other cultures as well. So it's that you know that contentious um, that sort of like the weight of not being able to like in Sarai's um, position, not being able to bear children, or even both um, Abram and Sarai not being able to have a family. Mm. You know, big deal. Yeah, yeah. So we end chapter 11 with, uh, here we have Abram, the son of a pagan, and his wife can't have kids. And that is all the setup we need for the rest of the story of Genesis, (laughs) where Abraham is basically the main character. Mm. Because from here, the book changes. We are now in a new section of Genesis. From chapter 12 onwards, I'm excited to go into it. Mm. And when we get to (laughs) Father Abraham... Who had many sons. Who had many sons. And many sons had had Father Father Abraham. Abraham, And I'm one of them. And and so so are you. you. (laughs) So let's all praise the Lord right Right up. up. Anyway, we'll get to that later. That's us. My reflection after that was that I think it was really hard after going from such an exciting story of Noah's Ark to mm. that, and I found mm. that quite boring. Yeah. Interesting, but boring. And I like, I was saying before, like, I like a juicy story. So I'm keen for the rest of Genesis, but that wasn't my favourite thing that we've done. Mm. Fair. Still good, though. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Again, hopefully the listeners get something of value out of that, but... <laughs> Yes, it's one and a half chapters of just straight genealogies. It's not the most interesting content. No, and it's just context. 
and mm. not even you know like too too much of an interesting context you know we could just be like well abram came from noah that's it right mm -hmm. but not all the bible is crazy noah ark stories no no and we shouldn't discount discount it mm. i guess my takeaway from reading these chapters is God's still trying, like, the, the willingness of God's still wanting to inter intervene in humans' life when he can see um, sort of the evil, the, the negative that's sort of um, starting to rise up in it. And, you know, I, I think it's this, it's, it's, it's unfortunately going to be this constant battle between humans' downfall and God. But time and time, ago, time, and time again, as I, as I keep saying, it's like, it's almost like it, God's giving, showing that mercy towards us by like, by wanting to intervene, hmm. um, you know, especially with with the flood and just the ability to wipe everyone out. Like instead of doing that again, it's just uh, scatter them rather than let's kill them off. So in a way, there's sort of that like mercy mercy being there by upholding the covenant that He's made. I guess that's my takeaway of God's still willing to intervene in in our lives, which I think is is great that He was, you know no matter what still wants to be a part of it, even like in the even in the good and the bad, He'll come and intervene. Hmm. My takeaway is when you read these chapters in light of the whole book of Genesis, you can see a clear direction, and that clear direction is we're heading towards Abraham and Israel. And that's what I've appreciated about having read all of Genesis and now coming back and doing it in detail. He's seeing, oh, all these nations are friends or foes of Israel, and here's where they'll come from. Oh, this is the blessed family line that keeps slowly leading down to Abram, which is going to be kind of the restart of this great rescue plan. And so I have enjoyed reading all of that context and seeing how it all slowly moves in the same direction towards the story of Abram and the rest of Genesis. And that's mm. my takeaway. That's a takeaway. I agree with Morgan. It's not the most entertaining <laughs> section to read, but it's there for a purpose and it's leading us somewhere. And I'm keen to get to that somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, hopefully, you know, you listeners, you watchers, you, um, if I've gotten something else out, out, like out of this as well. Mm. And, and, um, it's still, still in, in, interesting, uh, for you. And we'd love to hear, you know, those comments, those, those questions, those, so send, send it, uh, our way would love to see your thoughts on these these chapters of Genesis. And on that note, you know, if you're not following us on, on social media, follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, uh, Instagram, we're on Patreon as well. So if we want if you want to support us financially, um, mm. we, we we sort of do this for free. So if you want to support us financially, then uh, you can head over to Patreon and you can support us that way. You'll get a some extra content there, extra long early episodes. So there are benefits to it, but if you, but mainly if you want to support us, head a, head over that way. Don't forget to share the podcast. The podcast is growing. I can see the numbers. It's um, slowly reaching everyone, but we'd love that to continue and to to continue to grow and, and head on that upward trajectory. So uh, continue to 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 share it. We'd love this to to spread, and we'd love the word of God to to spread through it. Or well, how about I just end in a word of prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come together and we can continue to read your word. We can continue to be nourished by your word, Lord. And we thank you for all the listeners and that they can find some nourishment and some more info through your word, Lord. We thank you for your servant Noah and his sons, Lord. And we thank you that we're able to, to see the descendants go through and we're able to see that line of Shem and get your humble servant Abram and Abraham when we get there, Lord. We continue to pray for the week and everyone and that you be with everyone as they go out through their week and what they do in their life. In Jesus' heavenly name, I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone, for watching and listening, and we'll see everyone next week. Bye. 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 A Mustard Seed Creative Production.